Well, good morning. Happy Thursday. Windy Thursday, I should say the least, and now cold. Boy, the wind, the wind and the temperature drops so much. But I got my Bible here with me and I have a devotion to share with you using a bit of what I found from 1517, which is Christ for you, as I was preparing for my lectionary study that happened yesterday. If you ever want to join and be part of a small group study, look at the lessons more in depth before that coming weekend, join us at 1030 on Wednesdays in the Fellowship Hall. We have a really great group, a lot of wonderful discussion, a lot of great growing times. But this week, we looked at the three lessons. The first one about the Ten Commandments. Oh, I think you probably know the Ten Commandments, but great insight was shared at our study there. Then we looked at Jesus as he came into Jerusalem, turning the tables of the many changers and driving out all the animals and people who were making his father's house a den of trade, a den of robbers. And then you have the epistle lesson right in the middle of it. And we'll hear it this weekend. The epistle lesson is Paul's words to the Corinthian Christians, remind them that with everything else that goes that goes on in the church, all the entailments, all the, the stuff, that really got to remind ourselves the primary focus of what why we're here, to preach Jesus Christ and him crucified. There is no other statement, there is no other gospel besides Jesus Christ crucified, although it is almost preposterous to even consider Jesus Christ crucified is the wisdom of God, the power of God. So we're going to look at this from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. The Apostle Paul writes, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful, not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Here ends the word of the Lord. Now, this text is all about the crucifixion of Jesus. That means that every church that proclaims it is Christian needs to be proclaiming the cross of Jesus Christ, him crucified. It's the essential facet that holds all of us together. It is the, it's what's caused the Christian church to expand throughout the centuries. It wasn't just the Sermon on the Mount that really drove the Christian faith about those who are blessed and those how we're supposed to live, you know, differently. It was all about Christ dying, about God dying for us. So which reminds us, Christianity is not principally about ethics. It was the cross on the hill rather than the Sermon on the Mount that produced the impact that Christianity has now had. Don't ever forget that. Christianity is what it is, not so much because the mores of Jesus and how good he or nice and kind he was, but because Christ was crucified, and this is an act of God. But not only was it the crucifixion an act of redemption, it was also the greatest moment of divine revelation. Just consider this. This is Christianity. It's what Lutheranism is all about. Martin Luther taught that it was not that God is somehow there, despite defeat, despite the sorrow, despite the pain, despite the humiliation, the anguish, the failure, the sin and death. No, it, just, it wasn't that God just happened to be there. He teaches, Luther says, he teaches that God himself confronts us in person, and he makes his presence near in and through defeat and sorrow and sin and pain and humiliation and anguish and failure and even death. You know, the things that are then contrary to failure and sin and death constitute the raw materials from which God personally can transform the human heart. That's him amazing grace keeps coming back, how he has brought us back to life. From sinners, he has now redeemed us. You see, God reveals himself through a, a contrary form. That's how God works in a surprising way. But this contrary form is in a cruciform. 
It is the cross, not glory. It is crucifixion, not glorification. And that's how it is on this side of heaven. And it's precisely within this domain that we see God as he is in himself. Now, here's the thing. Churches and pastors have tried to sanitize, whitewash, if you will, or try to eliminate the cross from the Christian faith because they feel like it's a little offensive or they like to focus on other things or people, you know, they hear that Jesus died on the cross and oh, that's kind of old school. We want to make something more lively, more engaging. But the cross is the power of God to save us, to save all. And so our identity as Christians, our relevance as Christians is united in depth to the cross. It's all about the cross. Without it, you have no gospel. You have this manufactured treadmill of religion of good works. I and mean, that's really it is. When you teach morals, you teach nice and kindness, what you really have is a religion of good works. But what you have in the cross is the religion of grace, the religion of peace, of love, of God to the contrary. You see, what we have in the cross is Christ crucified as the victory of God. And that's surprising, surprising to the world because why would you have victory through death? We see death as an end. And yet what God does is he makes it much, much more. A doorway, an opening to eternal life with him. And so this truth is one we cannot, we cannot ever ignore or try to you know, steer away from. Because what secures our pardon is the crucifixion. We deserve to be killed collectively and individually. But that's why the crucifixion is so graphic, so frightening, because it's truly glorious and good for us. That's why we call Friday good. And too often in, in, in churches, the cross is relegated in our preaching of some, or even in church structures, to a back, you know, kind of off the side or a secondary thing, not the primary. We like to, we, people like to be entertained, they like to be made happy, and the cross doesn't provide entertainment or happiness. I remember I went with, took my daughter to a, uh, a mega church in Hawaii on Father's Day weekend. And as we were there, the one thing out of all the observations she made, why we never went back again, is that she never saw a cross there. Well, there was a cross, but on the backdrop of the stage, because it was mostly a band that was there, was the black lit continents. Again, trying to show that, hey, we are to be out for many nations, and that was something part of their mission statement for many nations. But the cross itself was kind of put off in the dark in the back. And I thought, you know, she made the comment, there's no cross. I said, no, it's up there in the shadows. You just can't really see it. Too many churches, too many Christians have put the cross off in the back, off in the shadows, and have lived life apart from it. But here's the thing. The cross of Jesus puts everything in our lives to the test. Martin Luther once said that he thought that this passage of 1 Corinthians is all about thinking about how we think about God comes to a blunt halt at the foot of the cross, coagulated in the blood of God. I mean, talk about graphic, right? The very existence of the cross and the crucified Christ forces us to make a crucial decision. Will we look for God somewhere else or will we own what God himself has presented as his own self-disclosure in the crucified Christ, as the basis of our knowledge of God and how we live before him. I mean, if we truly accept God of how he describes himself, how he, how he reveals himself to us, then we, re, we understand him to be one who, who has seen power in his suffering, to see victory in his death. And that's why the cross is such a significant symbol in our faith. It marks a dead end for most of our baseless musings about who God is, and opens the way to an authentically Christian understanding of who God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is, the one whom Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob worshipped as the one and only true living God. The crucified Christ presents us with a riddle, with a mystery, with the solution of that riddle that holds the keys to all Christian understanding of the nature and purposes of God, of human nature, of destiny. The cross answers all of this because it's a crucial mystery that because of the identity and relevance of the Christian faith, we are ultimately bound up with it and cannot be separated from it. For this one reason, this one reason only, it's a fact. Jesus Christ was crucified to the death, period. A fact is by definition something that is like an occurrence, an event, something that has happened. And that's the great rub of Christianity. The pebble in the shoe 
of all those skeptics of the Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was crucified. That's the stone-cold fact of history. We recite it in the creeds, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Tactus, Josephus, Pliny, and all the others cite it saying, he was put to death by the procurator. Now history, we are told, is irreversible. And we cannot undo her handiwork. But part of history is the fact that the Christian faith, the trust that we have in God, was created, aroused, and shaped by the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. It is a pattern of events that lay beyond its, beyond its control to which it could only respond in increasing wonder and amazement. And its implications were unfolded. Here on that hill called Golgotha, on the tomb, a hundred yards away, God entered to redeem the tragic history of creation and human failure. It was the action of God, and it demands a reaction. Therefore, Christians are compelled, not by a cross, but the crucifix. In the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, something is given, something over which we have no control. We may accept it and respond to it, attempting to work out its implications for our understanding of God and the world. But we also may reject it and base this understanding on something else. But there stands as a monument of the world over, the crucifix. He was, in fact, crucified under Pontius Pilate. Therefore, the Christian faith is not primarily about ideas or concepts, a philosophy of ethics or a way of life, even though it may give rise to them. At its heart lies an idea, doesn't lie in the idea or concept, but an event in human history. It is an occurrence in which God was engaged in the most intimate endeavor between creator and the creature, between life and death. From its very beginning to its end, the New Testament directs us to the crucified Christ, who is now risen and reigning from the power of the cross. And that is why he depicted, he's depicted with crowned with thorns, restrained, and uttering those availing words, Father, forgive them. He reigns like that. And it's in his present glory that we see this. We know how he is towards us because of the crucifix, not the ascension. So let the crucifix be raised as an emblem of his kingdom reign, his kingdom come. In every church, in every home, our God reigns and he reigns in this way. I mean, that's why last week as we had uh, George and the Holy, uh, the Holy Land arts that were shared, so many crucifixes are all symbols of the power of God and who we are, how Christ rules over us today. He rules over us as one who is nailed to a cross, crown of thorns on his head, who is dying for us. And so it's that power that then enlivens within us, empowers us to go out, to, to share this good news through the tortured event of the crucifixion. By bringing death, God's able to bring forth life. In a broken body, resurrected bodies, where condemnation leads to justification, where treason and betrayal bring vindication and friendship, where alienation and violence bring about adoption and peace. You see, the world is really turned upside down. Give Christ the crucified not only as a remedy for death, but for life on this side of the grave. So one may have hope and confidence, joy, a future in the knowledge of God, who is as near to, pers to personable as to us as pain and death. You see, for Paul, this text here, death and life, weakness and strength, suffering and glory, wisdom and folly, sorrow and joy are all interwoven in the fact of the crucifix. Paul's understanding of both the mission of Jesus and the Christian existence itself is dominated by such cross-centered themes of life and death, strength and weakness. The full force of Paul's insight is missed. If we interpret him as teaching that we can have life despite the death and strength, despite our weakness, because for Paul, the remarkable meaning of the enigma of the cross is how life comes through death and strength through weakness. The incongruity of the cross symbolizes the remarkable and paradoxical way in which God works out the salvation for those he loves, which is supremely demonstrated and accomplished in the crucified and risen Christ, but also bears direct relevance on the existence of every person. That's why we speak and share the fact of the, of the crucifixion and the resurrection. It is who I am. It is who you are. We have been brought from death to life 
from weakness to strength, from grief to victory. Today and throughout this Lenten season, as we've been guided to the cross in our midweek services, allow that cross to always be before your eyes. Maybe if you wear a cross necklace, remind yourself of the power that you have because that's the one who is your Lord, the one who rules over you by grace, mercy, and peace. For he loves you. And the cross is that symbol of love, like we talked about yesterday in our worship. It's a symbol of what love is to look like, what God looks like. And the power of God is then given to us, mere mortal people, to share by love, which is, again, his grace and power and mercy seen. You see how wonderfully paradoxical this is? The Almighty over all comes to take on flesh, comes to allow his creatures to put him to death. And there in his suffering and his dying is his power, his grace, is his glory truly seen. The cross, an instrument of God's glory, the expression of love to us. Cherish the cross in your life. See its power, see its glory as we see our God and his love for each of us. Let's close our time in prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice, for your gift of love and mercy. We thank you for how you revealed yourself to us, that you are not some God high above or some God that even comes in our great times, but one who meets us in our lowest, most dire, most painful and agonizing moments. You meet us there in person and you know us and is there in those times that you lift us up, that you redeem us, that you strengthen us, that you support us, that you give us life, even through death. Lord, help us to live with that hope, that assurance, that peace, and to share that message, that gospel message with others, so they too might know your love, so they might know your power, so they might see your glory in the crucifix of, of, of the cross of Christ. Bless us, Lord, to live in that faith each day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for joining us me today. Sorry, a little bit of a longer devotion, but um, this text, well, I get a little excited about it, don't I? I know it's early, but um, have a great day in the Lord. Know that I love you and aloha.